Two people missing. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so this was an idea um, that was brought to me by Cindy, and we're bringing it to life. So if you, if anyone has any ideas of any type of education they want, please always let me know, and we'll definitely do our best to make it happen. Um, I remember when I was an agent. Um, this was maybe back in like 2004 or so, and some of you might know Aaron Leiter. He's um, he owns a bunch of Keller Williams offices. Now he's left Keller Williams. He's opened up his own company um, in Palm Springs and is a, a great guy. He was president of our association and so on. But he's been like a role model to me. And I remember one of the things that he did was he created a study on a flip that he was doing. So he purchased a home in, um, it was in Santa Monica, like on San Vicente in Santa Monica. And he, um, was flipping and he was like, you know, why I'm doing this? Why don't I make this an educational opportunity for agents who want to be a part of this process? So we would have a meeting at least once a month where we would you know, either go to the property or meet in the office and talk about the whole process. So from the very beginning to acquiring the property, what that looked like to the process of remodeling it and then selling it and knowing and understanding all of the margins and so on. So um, it was super, super helpful. And I see this opportunity with Will's TIC as exactly the same thing, where we're able to kind of walk through the process with him and understand um, the day-to-day -day kind of things that have been happening and his experience with this project. Um, I would love for our office to be known as someone who specializes and who can do TICs very well. I think it's an amazing niche that uh, has so much opportunity. And I don't think the bigger brokerages are able to do this um, the way that a smaller boutique company could. Um, and I think that we have a huge opportunity here. Uh, the only other you know, real company out there that's much, much smaller than ours is the Rental Girls. And they've been doing this for a while and doing a great job at it. And I think we could expand on that and do it bigger and even bring it to a, a bigger audience. Um, TACs to me are, I, I, I am really passionate and, and excited about them because it creates more home ownership opportunities and it creates home ownership opportunities at a slightly reduced cost. So um, there's just a lot of advantages and opportunity that I think that we can take advantage of. And I'm just, I'm really glad we have a great group that's here today that's interested in learning. So I would encourage you to Stick with it with um, this. We're going to do this as often as we need to. I think at least you know once a month we'll meet, and it can be a short meeting. It can be as long as we need it to be, um, and kind of go through the process with Will. So you know we're already at the process where Will has listed the properties, but um, Will, if maybe you can start from the very beginning as far as like how did this idea come about? How did you acquire the property and so on? And I know a lot of people have questions as well. So um, why don't we start from there? Thank you, Will, I mean, for volunteering and being open to just sharing all this because, I mean, I, we all appreciate this so much. Thank you, thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy to share and I'm, you know, love to get all of you guys in on this. Um, so um, it's interesting because this story actually started um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Um, so Venus, who used to be with us, um, had a fourplex listing in Echo Park. And um, my, my friend and client, John Albanis, John was looking to do just a flip, uh, like a, just a, his, he does mostly multifamily flips. So, um, so Venus had this fourplex, John told me about, it. I'm like, oh, I know the agent. So, um, so we ended up, um, you know, making an offer on that. It was four one bedrooms on Rampart. And, um, and so, um, so John then went in and then converted them. They're huge one bedrooms. They are like each 1500 square feet. <laughs> so, or close to 1500 square feet. So um, he converted them all to three bedroom, two baths from one bedroom, one bath. Wow. Right? Wow, right. <laughs> So then, um, so the original plan was then to take that and then we were going to rent them out and then eventually sell that building once it had been fully rented. But 
the problem I was having with renting these out was that it was literally on the freeway ramp. <laughs> literally like the last house before you got on the 101. And I just couldn't get my typical Echo Park prices for, for rental for a three bedroom, two bath. You know, uh, nobody was willing to pay it. Uh, and so, um, so John had been reading about TICs and um, he reached out to, I don't know if he reached out to the rental girl or what happened, but somehow they were put in, um, they were put in contact. And, and rental girl was just starting their TICs like listings at that time. And so they were really motivated and they're like, oh, we could totally do this one. So they offered at the time to pay for his staging to do it. And so, uh, cause they just wanted to prove the concept. And he came to me, he's like, well, I know the plan was to rent them out and then to sell it, but I just kind of want to try this TIC thing and maybe we could do more later. I'm like, dude, do what you need to do. I totally get it. So, so they, they ended up putting those on the market, um, I think around 550, you know, mm -hmm. for three bedroom, two bath, right? And it took them a second, because once again, it's on the freeway <laughs> entrance, but it was just too good of a deal, I guess, for pe people to pass up. And he ended up getting them sold around like the 500 to 525 range, you know, each. So this was a fourplex. And for those of you who watched the Andy Serkin um, TIC talk seminar that we did last fall, you know that there's a big difference between doing a four and under TIC and a five and over TIC. Um, so just, you know, going back, let's talk about what a TIC is, okay? So TIC, once again, stands for tenant in common. And what the way I explain it, and I've had to do this many times in the last few weeks, is to be clear, when you're buying a TIC, you do not technically own your unit, okay? You are buying a piece of the entire property. So in his case, that first building, that fourplex on Rampart, okay? they were buying roughly a one quarter interest in the property. Now, it doesn't have to all be equal to TIC. In fact, they're usually not. In our Hayworth building, it is not because each of the buildings, each of the unit size is slightly different and the pricing is slightly different. So your ownership depends on how much of the building you actually own along with the purchase price, okay? So that's something to think about. And the biggest difference between that and a condo, like I said, is that unlike a condo Down. where you would technically own your unit and a condo has been zoned and mapped so that each it, unit has its own APN and its own property tax, okay? In a TIC, that is not the case. You do not have your own separate APN. There's one APN for the whole building and you have to pay your fraction of the property tax, which turns out to be roughly, right? Whatever you paid into it, right? So, um, but the big difference in most TICs is that you have to escrow those property taxes. Obviously for a lot, if you buy a condo or a single family, you can choose to pay your property tax all at once right? At the end, there's like the two times during the year that you have to pay it. Or you can, you can choose to escrow it. You can choose to pay it monthly. Okay. In a TIC, there's no choice. You are paying that, that monthly property tax. Okay. Um, so that you will escrow it so that they have enough to pay the property tax bill at the end of the year. Okay. So in this case, he had a fourplex, it was a lot easier. You, there's still some paperwork that needs to be done primarily by the lawyer, Andy Serkin, who kind of specializes in these, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not like you have to get like a whole nother level, which we did with Hayworth, which I'll get into, okay? But four and under, 
pretty easy. So if you have a client who has a fourplex, triplex, duplex that they're thinking about doing a TIC on, that's literally just an Andy Serkin call. Okay. Um, hey, I have to get off soon. So I just wanted to um, add to it that the one that Henny and I had a client and we bought, a, they bought into a fourplex. And this was 2018, October, 2018, when the rental girls were first, it's one of yeah. the first ones. That's when we sold, sold, that's when they sold Hay, uh, uh, Rampart, same time. Same time. Yeah. And, um, and the, the thing was the only complication was the lender because yes. that Sterling was the lender. And I think they're still, the lender, nobody else was doing it. You can't, couldn't get a loan any other way, but, but through Sterling. And um, uh, it turns out now that we got a phone call, they're gonna be selling it and they wanna buy a double the price property. They paid 550. I think all of these properties at that time seemed to be in that range. And the zip code was 90012. So mm -hmm. it was near downtown, but not, not quite downtown. And, um, it was a two bedroom for that price and that had been renovated. The only other thing I would add, and then I'll, I'll let you continue, is that the issue at the big issue, and I don't know how it is now because this is later years, the big issue was they had to have some in escrow. They couldn't, we couldn't do anything and move ahead until they had two units. So I don't know if that's what's going on now. So, so but... the reason for that, okay, the reason why, um, and, and John had to deal with the same thing on Rampart. Yeah, is yeah. Is that at, most people buy these, like I said, his goal was to sell that building, right? And he had a yeah. note on that building, right? A, a mortgage, you know, like a, a, he actually had a hard money loan. But right. it wasn't the type of thing where you could sell off individual units and pay off fractionally the loan. Right. You either have to pay off that loan or not. Right. So, so at the it time, or, yeah. and this is something you need to talk to your sellers about if you're in this position, is that you need to um, set it up because sometimes they need to pay off that loan at once, which means right. in this case, he needed all four to sell simultaneously. Is it still okay. the same now? It just depends on the type of loan that the seller oh, has. Okay. In his case, he was able to get three of them in escrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he got three of them and then he bought the last, the last one. one. Okay. Okay. And then he sold that one later. Right. Right. Okay. You know, so it all that... depends on the type of loan yeah. that mm -hmm. the owner has. Okay. The, the thing was when this started in 2018, the reason it was so near, I think it was San Francisco that was that had started them and had a lot of them. And then the rental girls, you know, decided they'd bring it down here. And it was kind of a whole people didn't trust it at the beginning. But now, obviously, that's um, that's changed. So um, it's changing. Anyway, it's, it still, it's still, as I'm finding, still, you know, <laughs> leery? yeah, it, it, it's still it's still new. Right. But, you know, so, when you, you in New York, it's so different with co-ops and with con and you know, right. it's a different mentality it's than a different mentality, right? It's a different market. So yeah, yeah. And, and and as Karen said, these come tenant and commons come, come primarily from San Francisco. I mean, really, the lawyer Andy Serkin, who um who does all these TIC agreements, it really he created this area of the law. He he uh, oh. he was in a fourplex renting, he wanted to buy the unit. And they couldn't get a condo mapped. So mm -hmm. they so he created a tenant and common agreement amongst the four owners. And uh, he basically has created this area of the law. DRE uses him as their main consultant uh, for this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So so once again, if you're doing four and under, it's a lot easier. It's literally just a phone call to Andy Serkin and getting the right paperwork. But the main thing is you have to talk to your um, your client, your your owner about what kind of financing that they have to make sure that it's um, you know it, it, that they if they need to sell them all at once, or um, uh, or if they're going to um, 
if they're going to sell them all at once or if they can sell them off fractionally, like if they own a cash, it doesn't matter, right? So that's something you absolutely want to ask your owners. Is Sterling the only one now that does those loans? No, or there's another okay. bank now. There's National Cooperative Bank. That's the other bank. So, um, so now moving on from that Rampart experience. So John had gotten that experience. He then went on to do a fiveplex in um, West, like near West Adams and was going to TIC that property. And so he got that under contract. He, he got, you know, I think he bought out the tenants in those. And then he, um, through that, he had to go through, because it was five units and more, he has to go through a, a very specific process through the DRE. Uh, and, and the DRE has to approve the TIC above five units. Now, as Andy Serkin says, they've never not approved what over five units, but technically the DRE has to approve it. So there is a process Sirkin will walk you through it, but there's like different papers, like a green paper, a pink paper, and then your white paper. And then on your white paper, you can start selling or you can close anyways. Okay. And, and there's a cost difference too, right? Well, if there I is think a I cost remember, difference. Like $20, yeah. $20,000. Exactly. For that, if if over you're five. doing five units or above, exactly. There's, there's a, exactly like the paperwork, the process, it's going to cost you close to 20 K. Okay. To do. So something to consider if you're doing five or more units in a, in a TIC, okay? So he had that, he learned the process through that five plex and, um, and, then, and then Rental Girl was going to do those. And then they actually had someone who went in and bought it as a multifamily, like just bought all five units. So he never actually went through the process of having to, TIC each unit because he went through the process of getting it TIC'd and then someone bought it from them, you know, as one, one piece. Okay. So that, that happened 2018, 2019. Fall of 2019, John is looking again. And at the time he was thinking for himself, he was thinking about buying a multifamily for his own family. He lives in West Hollywood. And, um, and he came across Hayworth. Hayworth was an eight unit apartment building, all two bedroom, one and a half bath. The rents were, you know, you know, West Hollywood rents, you know, so they're all over the place, right? There's some that are uh, market, but, but not even market because they're all older and, you know, it's not been updated or anything. And some of them are really, really low. Right. So he comes to me, he's like, Will, Thank you. Um, I think I found my next TIC. I think this is it. I'm like, okay. Uh, but at the time, he was already in three or four other buildings. So he was like out of cash. He had no capital whatsoever. Um, so he didn't even have the money to put down the earnest money deposit, <laughs> okay? Uh, and and so he came to me uh, and he's like, because we had been talking for a while about putting together a deal. And um, because I have people who have, you know, obviously we work primarily with investors working on the multifamily side, but I had other investors who were interested in TIC. So he's like, do you think you can help me raise it? And I'm like, yeah, I think I can. He's like, what are we going to do about the EMD? And I said, I, I ran the numbers real quick in my head, you know, obviously about what we thought we could sell each unit for. Um, and we, we, in our heads, thought we could get seven, 750 for them each, you know? So I said, um, I'll do it. So I put down the deposit. So that's why I'm an investor in the deal. Um, and then John wanted the rental girl to sell them for, for us, for the TICs. But after talking to Anthony, <laughs> I basically was like, no condition of the deal. <laughs> if I'm going to do this deal, then I want to be the broker on it. 
So that's why I'm the broker on this deal. Okay. So, uh, because I wanted to learn this process of how to do the TIC. So with this one specifically, um, I, um, so, so we got into it in the fall of 2019. Uh, John immediately started Ellis acting uh, the tenants um, and working out, you know, whatever, that whole process. Uh, not an easy process, uh, but ironically, the thing with Ellis is the tenants don't really have a choice, right? Because you're taking them off the rental market. And most TIC buildings are that way. They are ellis because, uh, you know, otherwise it's very hard to get the tenants out, right? So um, luckily for us, we did this pre-COVID, right? Because now there's a, there's a moratorium on Ellis evictions. So, um, so he did this all like in the, immediately in that ensuing period, uh, pretty much everybody left by the spring. Tim, did you have a question? No, okay. So, um, so we had been planning to list the first units in May of last year, May or June, uh, because he, he had got, like we had gotten most of the tenants out by um, February or March and, uh, and then COVID hit, right? So then, then that slowed us down. And um, we were eventually able to, obviously now we're at a point where seven of the eight units have been vacated. There's still one tenant left and we just signed a lease for her. So she's about to leave. Um, well, um, can you explain yeah. the, rule, the rules of the Ellis Act? So you said yeah. most of the TICs use that to get tenants out. Yes. What does that all mean? What's the timing, the rental sure. restrictions after and so on? Yeah. Sure, so Ellis Act is a state law that, that overrides any local jurisdictional rent control. That's the first thing you need to know. Very important. Because obviously West Hollywood and City of Los Angeles and Santa Monica are all very heavily rent controlled uh, jurisdictions. But with the Ellis Act, it's a, it, it, was, it was actually designed after, um, after Santa Monica put in their rent control regulations, which were really strict. Uh, there was a statewide rule that basically said, if landlords, owners do not want to rent out their units anymore as rentals, they have the right to do so. So that's what the Ellis Act says but there are restrictions with it, right? First of all, there's a buyout, right? You have to pay them. You have to pay the tenant to leave. But those, those numbers are set by law, okay? So you just have to look it up per jurisdiction. That's number one. Number two, for the first two years after a property has been Ellis'd, you cannot rent out that property at all. There's no exceptions to that rule. If you rent out a property, during those two years, you are in violation of the Ellis and you will be fined, okay? And you could potentially have like civil and criminal, like, you know, um, whatever, you know, uh, uh, files against you. So first two years, no rental whatsoever. Years three through five, you have to offer, if you try to rent it during years three through five, you have to find the previous tenants and offer them the rental back at the original rate that they were paying. Okay. So, so I always say for all practical purposes, five years, right? Five years, you're not renting that, that unit. Okay. After five years, then you can bring the property back up to market you have to once again offer it first to the people who used to live there, but um, but at that point you can bring it up to market. Now people are like, well, what if I don't know where those tenants are? How do I know? How do I get caught? Well, the way you get caught is if you put it on the market as a rental. When people put it on the market as a rental or an Airbnb or whatever it is, then people get caught because the previous tenant sees the listing because they know they were Ellis, right? 
So that's something for you guys to think about uh, and discuss with your with your clients. So we went through the Ellis Act with the Hayworth. Uh, we got kind of you know pushed back, obviously, with regards to the um, with the with the construction. And now, um, you know, finally, we like towards the end of the year, beginning of the year, we're like, okay, the, the units are ready. So, uh, so we started putting the first two on the market. Now we still don't have our white paper, which means we don't have the final uh, paperwork from the DRE because the DRE requires that all your work, at least on the exterior is finalized. And we still haven't finalized our work. So. So our white paper, we expect at the end of this month. So I'm actually making sure that all my offer, I can take offers now, I just can't close before we get the DRE white paper, which will be at the end of the month. So I'm not planning to close any of these deals. I, I actually put in 60 days just to make sure. And interestingly enough, like it's 11 o'clock. In one hour, I will get, I, that's the final deadline. For all for for best and finals for the first two units, so I'll, I'll know exactly where we stand. Um, so there are only two lenders that do this type of financing, this type of TIC financing. One is Sterling Bank; they're the big Kahuna, and the other is National Cooperative Bank. But recently, Sterling has started putting uh, restrictions on what they will lend on. One major restriction that affects us and affects all TICs is they will not lend on every TIC unit in a building. They will only lend on three quarters of a building. So in my case, I have eight units. That means max, they will lend on six of the units. Okay. Why? That is a decision by Sterling. They just don't wanna be the only lender on a building, I guess. There's also, they also won't lend on a certain amount. Um, and I don't know what that amount is. I think it's like, meaning like if the unit's below 350,000 or some really low number, they won't do that either. Okay. So, so you have one, to, or, yeah. one, sorry, one question Will, about, so if there's two different lenders and on the last property, we had to sell all of them simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, this one, do you have to sell them simultaneously? No. I know you just so have this two, one, how, how does all that work? Yeah. So this one, we don't have to sell simultaneously. And the reason being, because obviously we knew going in, this one we would do as a TIC. So we are with a lender that is aware we're doing a TIC, they do, they allow fractional payback. So as our money comes in, we can fractionally pay them back. So the the um, when you bought it, you bought it with a particular lender with that in mind. Who was that lender? Uh, it is Ken. Do you remember? Is Ken is on it here? Conventus. Oh. It's Conventus. That's right. It's Conventus. Conventus. Okay. Is it um, common that lenders will do that? Is there only a couple that do that, or are there rates higher? Like Conventus, what... Conventus is a hard money lender. So we went with the hard money in this case. Uh, we were putting together a new group of investors. We hadn't done anything previously. It's always hard to get a conventional lender to do it unless you already have a relationship with that bank. So you have to talk to your bank. Um, but in this case, it was a hard money lender. And Conventus, because they're Bay Area based, they do a lot of TICs, TIC lending. So what's the interest rate for, for Conventus? Is it 10%? I think ours is like eight and a half. Eight and a half? Yeah. And I also noticed that you actually uh, are lending more than your purchase price. Is that a reason? Yes. We are lending more than our purchase price. And the reason being because we it was construction financing. Oh. So we use that money, A, to buy out the tenants, and then B, to renovate the units. That's how you make a deal with no cash, <laughs> no cash in hand. That's awesome. Well, we we did we did well, put it still cash. less we, cash. We raised, yeah, we <laughs> raised we raised about we raised a little over a million. I think it was like one point two million between all the investors. And what was the purchase price just for the unit without the extra the additional loan amount? Three point three five million. Okay. 
So, so, and by the way, I did not broker the sale. Uh, John worked directly with the listing agent to get us that deal. And I do that myself. When I'm, when I'm an investor myself, I will go directly through the listing agent just to get the deal because it's more important to me than, than my commission for that particular property. Obviously, when I'm a broker, I don't do that. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so, so we got the financing. We're in construction. We're doing, we're doing the buyouts. We're doing the renovations. And now, so the two banks now are Sterling and National Cooperative Bank. National Cooperative, um, because Sterling is only doing three quarters of units now, National Cooperative is doing more. Uh, they require it 25% down. So, so one thing you need to know about TIC financing in general is that it's harder to qualify for a TIC loan than a regular condo loan, okay? Um, the debt to income ratio, you have to have less debt and more income, okay? You have to have at least six months of reserves. So we're finding that a lot of people who were qualified for condos are not qualified for TIC because the lenders are more conservative when it comes to TIC. So that's something for you to be aware of if you're gonna represent a buyer on a TIC, okay? But one good thing about that is that then the buyers are more qualified. And you're, they're finding that, they said there's less than a 1% foreclosure rate on TIC so far, even during the pandemic. And the down payment as well, right? The, I think the minimum is 10%. With Sterling, it's 10%, but obviously you can put more 20, 25, okay. 30, and, and then your your rates will come down, stuff like that. National Cooperative requires 25%. Okay. So those last two units may be a little bit more difficult. Well, or... I have cash offers on my first two units too. So okay. I, so, so as I'm so one of the things we're going to have to think about as we're accepting offers is I'm looking at these offers. I We have to decide if we're going to take a lesser cash offer, you know, rather than a higher financed offer. These are things that we have to think about. And if you have someone coming in with a higher down payment, you can guide them to not to Sterling, but to, I forgot the other name of the, the other the bank, right? Cooperative bank. Yes. Okay. Any questions? For Conventus, the loan term, so do you have any like prepayment penalty or you actually get the loan for like two years? So how does it work? There's no prepayment penalty on, on hard money, no. Okay. But the problem we're having is we've got delayed, so we actually need an extension. So you only got it for one year? Uh, yeah, I think initially. it's a year and a half. A year and a half? Yeah. Ken, uh, you've been doing a lot of showings. What kind of questions are you getting? Um, mainly about the TIC structure, you know, just educating them on the fractional ownership, as well as, you know, you have the, um, you know, uh, right to use that space, but, you know, it's a fractional ownership, as you explained earlier. Um, the second, of course, is financing. Um, of course, I tend to direct them to Sterling or National Cooperative on that, but, um, you know, to get them pre-qualified. And then the third um, is, you know, there's a lot of questions on, is there an HOA? Is there a property manager? What if I have something, an issue, who do I contact? And so, um, you know, the way I explain it is that, you know, the day-to-day, -day, of course, there's an HOA, there's HOA fees. So in that sense, it's very similar to a condo, but, um, you know, um, there is no, like, uh, it's, not a, it's not a condo, of course, you know, so there are rules and regulations. Um, so those are the questions. Um, and then sometimes I get the question about, okay, since there's only one APN, what if somebody doesn't pay their taxes or what happens in that case? And so as you explained earlier, you know, the taxes are impounded um, in escrow. And so, and of course, Sterling has this a very strict requirement on that so that they have um, less chance of, of a delinquent tax payment. So. Um, so those are the questions that I'm, I get a lot. Um, 
um, on the finance, you know, of course the price, you know, uh, is, is about 10 to 15% lower than market. So, um, that's a reflection of this, you know, tighter financing availability. Um, of course, the fractional ownership is a little different structure, but, um, as far as the day to day, I always tell, you know, people that it's not anything different day to day, you know, um, it's just that the overall structure is different. So. And I mean, for our specifically, I mean, Anthony and I walked the units and I think if ours were condos, we would be in the 900 range, yeah. you know, for ours, easily, you know, even, yeah. and for some of the units, it might be over a million, you know, for like front unit with the yard and the balcony, you know, if we were a regular West Hollywood condo, but we, we priced it the way we did specifically, I mean, Ken and I combed through all the comps and we decided to list it like this, the way we did specifically because it is a TIC. We knew the financing was going to be an issue and um, we wanted to make sure that we got them sold, you know? So what? when they when they look at the appraisal then um, for each uh, buyer, do they are they looking at the whole complex together as uh, a piece of that, or are they looking at individual units, condo units, comparison ten to fifteen percent below? Do you know I, that we don't know because we okay. I haven't gone through yet the um, I haven't gone through the uh, the appraisal process, but I'm told that they will appraise the entire building and the specific unit. Mm, okay. One um, one thing to add with Ken, um, if when people ask, you know, is there an HOA who's going to take care of the property? How does that work? Um, my understanding is it's just exactly the same as any condo. It's up to the owners to do what they want. So yeah, there is yeah. no difference there. You can have it yeah. self-managed where there's an HOA president and the money and everything's managed by someone in the building, which is rare and not really recommended in most cases. Um, or you hire a management company and it is professionally managed. Um, and that's what most buildings will do, especially, you know, eight units, uh, eight the size of a building like that. Um, so I would just be, I would let people know, be rest assured, this is a new, it's, it's, it was a new construction condo. It's the same thing. It's up to the owners to decide what to do. But we recommend that you have a management company and maybe Will and Ken, you can have um, some referrals for the homeowners of management companies, you know, right from the start um, and talk to them about suggestions on costs and what they would do and so on, just so people feel more comfortable with that aspect of it. Yeah, actually, that, that's that's a great point, because once I mention that to when I do the showings, um, it actually puts them at ease because they can relate to it, you know, and, you know, I say the day to day is not any different than a condo than than it does like um, it clicks with them. I can see like that the ownership part and everything is sometimes, you know, I get the, um, uh, you know, not quite understanding look, you know, that. Um, and that's, that's, that's normal, but I just tell them day to day, uh, it's not, not any different than owning a condo. So. Sorry guys, I'm, I'm responding to an offer. She, I'm actually representing her. So I have to like email her, <laughs> uh, but feel free um, ask questions, ask questions, feel free. Well, no, I guess it's similar to when you're selling a condo in the marina and there's like a $1,500, you know, monthly HOA or whatever, like the, the lease um, or on Wilshire Boulevard. So it's kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's obviously a different situation, but that piece that you have that huge second HOA fee is, is kind of similar. Like the prices are a little bit lower. Well, it's, so, not, yeah. it's not a second HOA fee. Let's be clear about that. It's your taxes. True. It's your taxes that you would have to pay anyways. Right, right. It's just how you pay them, whether you pay them monthly or at the end. But one way or another, you're paying those taxes. So, Will, so you need to sell uh, all the all eight units before you decide whether which, which management company going to handle the money and uh, taking care of the rest of the stuff at the uh, Hayworth property? No, we can find that at any point. Um, I think we're, I, John is, you know, the general partner is handling right. that. Uh, we were obviously when it was rentals, we were managing it, right? Uh, but we don't do HOA management. So, um, 
So we're we're talking to several folks that including, you know, there's even like CPAs who specialize in condos or TICs. So we're talking to people like that as well to handle the financials. And what are the criteria when you're looking for a, a multifamily property to convert into TIC? You know, because yesterday I spoke to John, he says, you know, the place has to look homey enough, you know, so that's what I want to know. Yeah, it has is. to feel like a community. It can't, it's hard to say, but certain properties feel like apartments, feel like rentals, and certain places lend themselves to like, it feels like um, it could be a community, you know, like the Hayworth feels like a community. Like, you know, it, it, it's set apart from the prop, you know, from the street, it's bad, it's, it's, it's you know, it's gated, it's, it's got its own vibe. It's just not, you know, for some that's gonna work and for some it's not. Is location more important than the look and feel? Because do you think that the people buying into tech are more a younger crowd? They wanna be closer to things, restaurant, dining, walkability? I don't know about that. Okay. I don't know about that. I, I think the building quality is, is, is important. Like Will said, if it feels like a condo rather than just an apartment building, it makes all the difference. If it has some character, some charm. And we're lucky in LA because there's a lot of buildings that are like that. There's some gorgeous like fourplexes that should be owned and not rented, you know, individually. And people can, I think there's tons of those. Like. That would be my focus is getting fourplexes um, into uh, TICs. There's so many cool buildings that you know have a shared yard and create that small community where it's not it's not too overwhelming, but it's you know small enough. Um, West Hollywood has tons of like really charming buildings, but all over LA there's a lot of them. Even like up and down, um, uh, I don't know, like kind of like some of the off streets around. Um, La Cienega, like those side streets there, there's a ton of like really cute fourplexes between La Cienega and Fairfax. Um, those I think are prime for that. There's a ton of Lamert too. Lamert was done as a planned community. So there's lots of multifamily mixed in with the single families. Um, I have a question about Ellis acting. Mm -hmm. So when does this, the clock start ticking for that five years? When the last person is Ellis act? when you first so you you have to file paperwork with mm -hmm. like it's it's actually on the de like on title right so when there's a title pull people will see that it's ellis active so um so uh i believe it's when you file that paperwork with the city and it's recorded and that's like the first thing you did probably or very early in the process you did that yeah, I, I, I recently pulled that up. It was actually last, it was like in the fall. I, I think it may have been after we got all the, all the, you know, we have to obviously get all the signatures and everything. That's not, I didn't deal with that. John did. So I can, I can okay. find it. Well, just roughly. Um, also, uh, since you can't rent these units for five years, I'm assuming that the buyers can't either. So are your, are your, are your buyers pretty much all end users that are planning to live there? Correct. Okay. Yeah, TIC is primarily for ownership. It's not really for investors. Are they? You can't. Well, only for a few years, right? So it's already been a couple of years. There's just three more years left. So are they signing something that says, you know, we yeah, are aware of this? I mean, they, they have to, yes. Part of it, okay. And then you mentioned that one of the units, you just re-signed a lease um, for- oh, so No, 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 so no, we didn't sign a lease. So, we signed a lease for her to leave to, for another property. So Okay, so everyone is out and that's okay. I was like, out. is there yeah. one person staying longer? How's that work? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've had people ask, like, is there still a tenant? I'm like, yeah, there's one tenant left. Yes, and she is leaving shortly. Okay, okay. Question, so other than pulling permits for any of the rehab with the city or um, uh, the Ellis Act, s sending information to that, are you dealing with the city for any other reason? Or is no, it just state so DRE? I mean, he, you know, he's mostly dealing with the city for, I mean, the city of West Hollywood was for a while very helpful with some of our tenants. With, city of West Hollywood was actually more helpful than the city of LA because it's smaller. And, right. um, and so that was surprising to us um, that we got some more help. They were actually for a while really trying to help us with some of, we have the last one we have, she's very elderly. She's in her 90s. 
Oh, geez. so we were, and, and she's very low income, like very low income. So it was real. It's been really hard to find a place for her. Uh, for a while, City of House Hollywood was trying to help us, and then they just stopped helping us. So, um, so we we actually, as an ownership group, we're taking it upon ourselves to help. Okay. Her, you know. So, Will, do you normally find this kind of um, multifamily deals on or off markets? Both. Both? Both. Do you prefer to do four units and up, uh, or you, you think that, you know, when we first started, we should start with just four units? That's a good question. Um, at this point, I, I, I obviously, I'm okay with either one, but... Um, when I first started, definitely like one to four or two to four, technically, I guess the, the easier thing about that's all about financing, right? So like two to four, you're still considered residential. So the financing is a little bit more straightforward. Like it's just, you know, typically people require 25% down on an income property and, um, there's more lenders who will do it five or more it just switches the type of lending, right? Because five units or more, it's commercial lending. Then they look at the property itself and then they tell you how much to put down. They'll be like, okay, based on the income and whatnot, you need to put down 50% or 40% or 30% or whatever it is. I've never seen 30 actually. So do you, so do you think that it's, I mean, I guess it is possible, but um, if you are going to be an owner user, right? And you buy a fourplex, you could technically buy this fourplex with three and a half percent down and live in one of them and sell the other three units over time. That Correct. could be a real interesting you do that. way for you someone. Absolutely do that. However, in that case, then you have to sell all three units simultaneously. Okay. Right? Because of the, your financing, right? You couldn't you couldn't sell them fractionally, right? Because mm -hmm. you're on an FHA loan. So you yeah. have to pay it all back at once. But three is a lot easier than eight. buy your own unit to pay for the whole thing, right? So that's that's where that gets tricky. But yes, you could technically do that. Okay. Well, this was super, super helpful, Will. Um, I would love to um, connect again maybe next month and sure. just have another time for a question and answer as well as any updates because now we'll hopefully have properties that will be in escrow by next month and see how that process is going and um, keep it up. And I have it recorded. So I'll, I will have this available for you guys to kind of come back to as a reference in case maybe it's not something that you're going to look at now, but maybe in a year from now, you will want to. Um, so I think the information we got today was super valuable. So any further questions from anyone today? Kyra, do you want to say anything? Hi, I, awesome. I, I was just listening in. It was nice to hear the um, backside of it all, Will. Do you have anything on the paperwork that people should know? Um, no, it's just been uh, a learning learning thing for all of us. Um, it's As far as our disclosures go, um, we are doing basically the same as what we would do for any other regular condo. Yeah. So. I think the one question we get a lot is, can I see the TIC agreement? Yeah, um, and um, I always tell them, well, if you get into escrow, of course you can see the TIC agreement, you know. But it's like any CCNR, right, on a condo, yeah. right? You get it when you're in escrow. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as your as far as your contract and all that other stuff, absolutely, that's um, that's completely different paperwork that you um, explained earlier on with having Andy draw that all that up, all that information up. But yes, but. We're just, yeah, we're just um, learning this one together. So <laughs> thanks for letting me listen in. Absolutely.